everyone! In this video I'm going to do a very crude introduction to quantum mechanics and atomic orbitals and these concepts will help us derive molecular orbitals and help us understand bonding and reactivity in organic chemistry. Quantum mechanics, also known as wave mechanics, stems from the wave-particle duality of electrons, which states that electron can be mathematically described as a particle or a wave. When we describe it as a wave, the mathematical solutions tell us that electrons can only exist in specific states with discrete energies, which means that they are quantized. And what this is referring to are the orbitals that should already be familiar to you from general chemistry. For instance, like the 1s, the 2s, the 2p. So how do we move from electrons being described as waves to orbitals? Well, first let's start by talking about properties of waves. When a wave is bound, we get standing waves. So you can think about it as kind of like strings on a guitars. And we can solve the wave equation to get the properties of the wave. So the wave equation is shown here. And what you see in this wave equation are the wave functions. So this is a differential equation and out of it, we get the wave functions. And the wave functions describe everything about the wave. The wave function describes the shape, the amplitude, and the phase of the wave. Another thing to know is that there are many solutions to this wave equation, meaning that there are multiple wave functions that will satisfy this equality. So let's take a look at what these different wave function solutions are. Let's look at the simplest solution to the wave equation. The wave function would look something like this. Then the next one would look like this, and the next one would look like that, and so on and so forth. And what you notice between all these different wave functions is that there is a different number of nodes. A node is where the wave's phase changes sign and the wave's amplitude is equal to zero in that region. Let's take a look at the nodes in our wave function. In our first case, there are no nodes, then the wave function is positive all the way through. In our second wave function, the wave function changes sign from positive to negative once, and there's a node right in the middle where the wave function's amplitude is equal to zero. So there's one node. And in our next case, there are two nodes, and these are the two places where the wave function changes sign. So we'll write a two here. And the more nodes that a wave function has, the higher the energy of that wave. Now let's apply the wave analogy to electrons and atoms. If we take the wave equation and we adjust it for the potential and kinetic energy of the electron around a nucleus, then we get what is called the Schrodinger equation. This equation accounts for the electrons being bound inside the atoms by the charge of the nucleus. And if we solve the Schrodinger equation, we get these sort of three-dimensional standing waves of the electrons around the nucleus. Now these three-dimensional electron waves that we get from the Schrodinger equation are the orbitals that we're familiar with. So let's compare the one-dimensional wave analogy to the atomic orbitals. The first one that we looked at, the one that does not have any nodes, is analogous to the 1s orbital. And the 1s orbital also does not have any nodes. Uh, the second one with one node is similar to the orbitals from the second shell. For instance, like this 2px orbital. And the third one is similar to the orbitals from the third shell, for instance, like this 3dxz orbital. It's important to emphasize that in our three-dimensional orbitals, the nodes are also going to be three-dimensional. So for instance, in the 1s orbital, there are no nodes, but in the 2s orbital, there is a nodal sphere that kind of separates the inner portion from this outer portion. In the 3s orbital, there are two nodal spheres, one right there and one right here. In the 2pz orbital, for instance, the node is actually a plane, and this nodal plane lies along the x-y axes, and it cuts uh, horizontally across the two lobes. In the 3dxz orbital, there are two nodal planes. One lies along the z-y plane and cuts vertically, and the other nodal plane lies along the y-x plane and cuts horizontally. And as you probably would have guessed, the energies of these orbitals increase with the increasing number of nodes. So for instance, the 1s orbital does not have any nodes and it's the lowest energy orbital. The second shell orbitals have one node, so they are higher in energy. Then the third shell orbitals have two nodes and then so on and so forth. 
Now we have to assign the electrons to these orbitals. And before we do that, let's look at the principles and the rules that will guide us through this process. The first is the Aufbau principle, and it tells us that the orbitals are filled in the order of increasing energy. So going from the 1s to the 2s to the 2p and so on and so forth. The next is the Pauli exclusion principle, and it tells us that each orbital can only accommodate two electrons at most, and those electrons would have to be spin paired, meaning that one is spin up and the other one is spin down. And last is the Hund's rule, which tells us that when filling orbitals of the same energy, electrons are assigned to fill as many orbitals as possible with their spins unpaired. So for instance, like these 2p orbitals have the same energy, so when we fill them up, we have to fill up all three of them at once. And then any additional electrons that are added would have to be added into these orbitals as spin paired electrons. Let's take a look at an example of the electron configuration of oxygen. Oxygen, as we know from the periodic table, has eight electrons, so we have to start filling them in starting from the lowest orbital. First, we're gonna put two electrons into the 1s orbital. And remember that they have to be spin paired in order to be in the same orbital. Now we have six more electrons left, so we're gonna put, them, put two of them into the next higher energy orbital, which is the 2s orbital. And again, we're gonna put them in spin paired. Now we have four electrons left over to be filled into these 2p orbitals. And remember from Hund's rule, we have to spread the electrons out into as many orbitals as possible. So let's put the three electrons spin unpaired into each of these 2p orbitals. And we have one more electron left, and now we can spin pair it into one of the existing 2p orbitals. All right, so here's the ground state configuration of an oxygen atom. The reason why we're talking about all of this orbital stuff is because we want to use orbitals to help us understand how atoms are bonding in organic chemistry. But before we do that, let's go back to our one-dimensional wave analogy. And let's talk about how waves are added. So we're gonna start with two waves that are in phase with each other, meaning that their positives and their negatives are in the same spatial region. And we're gonna add them together spatially. And what we're gonna get is a similar wave, but whose amplitude is twice as high. Now what if we start with two waves that are out of phase with each other? When we add them together, what we're actually going to get is a wave with absolutely no amplitude because the positives and the negatives are going to cancel out. So keep this in mind and in class we're going to talk about how orbital interactions create bonds.